Could all take your seats, please? If you could take your seats, please, is this on? For once, I'm just too tall for the mic. Well, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be back with you again. Uh, I've been coming in and going and uh, sometimes watching the proceedings uh, on um, uh, which have been streamed, and I've been doing so with uh, great interest. And um, uh, it's not often that we have such uh, great and uh, dedicated crowds like this, and uh, so I'm enjoying not feeling guilty for not being always in the room because uh, we always feel like uh, we have to make uh, a larger and larger audience. So that's yet another sign of the success of, uh, of the summit. Now, uh, you're not supposed to take a lot of time uh, to introduce the person who's going to introduce the keynote speaker, uh, even when he is your boss. So let me try to do this with some dispatch. Uh, Phil Hanlon became uh, uh, the 18th president of Dartmouth on June 10, uh, 2013. He is a 1977 graduate of the college, and he holds a doctorate in mathematics from Caltech. He's had a very distinguished career as a mathematician and a university administrator, uh, including um, most recently before he came to Dartmouth as provost of the University of Michigan, where I think they have more students than we have in the entire Upper Valley population. Is that about right? Yes. Um, which is why it's so great that there are so many people here. And um, anyway, I'm pleased, um, I'm really pleased that Phil could join us because he is, in a sense, a charter member of the Strauss Symposium, having participated uh, in the first one uh, during that last academic year. He had not only kicked off our sessions with his remarks, uh, but he participated as a scholar sitting and thinking with other researchers about the mathematics of prediction. Uh, since that event was focused on early warning for mass atrocities, and, and that for me was a particularly great moment. Uh, the most important thing you need to know about Phil, uh, for those of you who are from the outside, is that since arriving at Dartmouth, he has been a clear and consistent voice urging our community onward, exhorting us to address, as he said in his uh, inaugural remarks, uh, the most vexing problems facing mankind and the subject of the earthquake summit and how we can best respond to natural disasters clearly uh, meets that test. Um, Think Big has been Phil's message to Dartmouth and so he is exactly the right person to be here uh, to speak to this group and to introduce our, our keynote. So I'm uh, particularly pleased to hand over the microphone to him. Thanks, Dan, and thanks, everyone, for showing up late on a Friday afternoon. I'm very impressed by, the, uh, by your fortitude. And uh, as Dan mentioned, I participated in the Strauss Symposium last year and had such a great time that I'm back for more. I'm looking forward to it. It is a pleasure to join you today, and I'm thrilled uh, that we will hear such an engaging lecture by Swarman Wagle. Um, thanks to Swarmam and all of the presenters, the participants, and the students who have come together for this momentous summit at Dartmouth. I do want to take a moment just to recognize the efforts of Dan Benjamin and Ken Bauer and all those, their colleagues at the Dickey Center who have managed to assemble a truly amazing group of minds on campus this week. Uh, academics, practitioners, uh, social entrepreneurs, a group of experts who understand the complexity and the many dimensions of disaster relief and redevelopment. And I know I've heard already that the uh, conversations to date, yesterday and this morning and earlier today, have been wide raging and thought provoking. And I, I expect the same from the lecture we're about to hear. The, the Strauss Symposium is an event centered on the analysis of current global issues and so how appropriate it is that the Dickey Center has capitalized on this opportunity uh, to leverage the expertise of individuals in technology and medicine and anthropology and the arts, as well as uh, leaders in the Nepali government. 
to tackle the effect of this terrible event, this terrible uh, two earthquakes, and to reflect and to connect and to look to the future. And uh, as Dan mentioned, uh, any of you who have heard me speak on campus will know that I, I consistently talk about my vision for Dartmouth being a place of bold thinking and intellectual risk taking, a place with the courage to take on some of the world's most urgent issues and pursue some of its most compelling opportunities. And also a place where students are full partners with faculty in the business of making a difference in the world. And this summit is truly a manifestation of every one, every element of that vision. So I am, I'm very proud that Dartmouth is hosting this event. And once again, I wanna welcome all of you to campus uh, and to tonight's lecture and the stimulating sessions still to come tomorrow. And uh, I actually am not introducing the speaker. I'm introducing Eric Edmonds, who's going to introduce the speaker. So, <laughs> Eric, <laughs> all yours. It's not often um, that we have a speaker um, who's able to join us and travel from quite so far as uh, Dr. Wagley. So it seems suitable that then we would give you uh, three introductions <laughs> as opposed to just one. Um, I think we're very fortunate today to have um, Dr. Wagley to campus because I think it's fair to say that there was no one in the Nepali government um, who did more than Dr. Wagley to help build awareness of the impact of the quake and the needs of the Nepali people in its aftermath. Um, Dr. Wagley is an economist um, and a true global citizen educated in Nepal, um, educated in England, in the United States, and in Australia. And after working for more than 15 years as a development professional, Dr. Wagley became a member of the National Planning Commission for the government of, uh, government of Nepal when the quake hit. In that position, he was well known for being a very accessible public figure, an innovator in the use of social media, and extremely adept in the use of traditional media to help bridge the gap between the government of Nepal and the people of Nepal. He also built new avenues to foster open, constructive interactions between the government of Nepal and civil society. Been closed. Disaster needs assessment. I look forward to learning about his experiences in translating needs into action in the aftermath of Nepal's quake. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Swarnam Wagle to Dartmouth. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Edmonds, for that generous introduction. I am uh, delighted. Is this, is this working? Okay. I'm delighted to be here at Dartmouth. Um, I thank Ken Bauer and uh, Sienna Craig uh, for uh, inviting me to deliver this lecture, this keynote address at this very important conference. Um, I am touched that they are such great friends of Nepal. Um, I'm honored that the president of uh, Dartmouth College is here, uh, Phil Han uh, Hanlon. Um, and uh, I also thank the uh, director of the Dickey Center, uh, Daniel Benjamin, uh, for the warm hospitality extended to me um, uh, since yesterday and, and uh, in the run-up to, uh, to this program. Um, when um, Ken Bauer asked me if I could make it to this conference, I, um, I think it was back in September uh, last year, I immediately said yes, because uh, I have fond memories of, of uh, having come to Dartmouth almost 22 years ago. In fact, this was my first visit to the United States was, uh, was uh, to visit New Hampshire and here in Dartmouth. I had a high school friend who went to Dartmouth and uh, after spending a year as a young undergraduate uh, at the London School of Economics, uh, I thought uh, it would be wonderful to see America and uh, I, I spent uh, the summer of 94 uh, here in Hanover uh, and in the vicinity. So very fond, uh, fond uh, uh, memories. Um, the panels this morning uh, and uh, in the afternoon were excellent. Um, it was a fantastic initiative. We got a lot of micro stories, things that happened on the ground, lots of innovative 
um, initiatives and things that people did from the heart and with all their uh, you know, zeal and passion for Nepal. Uh, it's really uh, touching, you know, the, the, the reserve of solidarity and goodwill for Nepal uh, wherever I go is really, uh, really uh, amazing. Uh, the stories of humanity and the, and the goodwill, I think all that came, uh, came through in the, in the, different, the three panels this morning. Um, uh, uh, the narration and the documentation, the importance of it, the ongoing work by, by leading scholars uh, with affinity to Nepal, the interesting use of social media and uh, entrepreneurship, and the last panel on public health. What I'll do today is really complement these micro stories on the ground with uh, what I saw um, as, a, as a senior policymaker in Nepal when I served in government, um, but also as a private citizen of Nepal. Um, and uh, I think the panels this morning and what I'm going to talk about will sort of uh, give a well-rounded picture of uh, what worked in Nepal, uh, where we failed, and what are the kind of lessons that we can learn going forward. So that's, that's really the purpose. And um, I've decided to break my lecture address into three parts. The first part, you know, I was very much inspired by all the stories, personal stories that people were saying. So I would actually narrate to you my own story of where I was during the quake, um, what was the uh, uh, thinking at the, at the high level of uh, political leadership in the government of Nepal when the quake hit and, uh, and the first 24 hours. Um, and I'm gonna read off a prepared text so that I can hopefully transport you you know, to Nepal, to that moment, and see sort of, uh, you know, what, what went on in our minds at the time, and, and, the, and the kind of things that were put in motion in the first 24 hours. Um, that will be for about 12 to 15 minutes. Then I'll spend uh, the bulk of my talk, actually, uh, more informally, you know, walking through maybe 15 or so takeaways, uh, the key lessons and, uh, the policy experiences, um, and, uh, and we'll conclude with, with a few pointers for the future. So, um, it's not working? Shall I, I can use this. Is it? if I shout? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Let, me, let me do that. So the first part of the talk is really, I'm going to read off this text on the larger context, uh, both the geology and the history, the historical context, and the first 24 hours. The mighty Himalayas span six countries, but Nepal has always been at the center of the arc. The tectonic collision that began 55 million years ago between the Eurasian and the Indo-Australian plates continues to nudge the mountains northward by about two inches each year. It is this process that makes the dense settlements across the northern swathe of South Asia, home to about a billion people, prone to seismic shaking every few decades. Earthquakes in the Himalayas are congenital. The longer the buildup in the crust, the more catastrophic the outcome. Along this thrust fault system, which is the world's largest, there have been at least 20 notable earthquakes recorded over the past thousand years. According to geomorphological proof collected from carbon dating of alluvial deposits, three of them stand out for the scale of devastation they caused in Nepal. The first recorded one was the great quake of 1255 that wiped off one third of Kathmandu's population, including King Avaya Malla. The second one was the West Nepal earthquake of 1505, 
And the third is the Nepal-Bihar earthquake of 1934, which killed 16,000 people and destroyed much of the Kathmandu Valley. Against this backdrop, the earthquake of April 25, 2015 was not the big one that Nepalese had been warning each other about for the past several decades. Yet, the shaking of magnitude 7.8 for about one minute ended up claiming nearly 9,000 lives, destroying over half a million houses, and imposing an economic cost worth about one third of the national output. This was the biggest natural disaster that Nepal had faced in over 80 years. It also ruined dozens of cultural monuments that marked the glory of the Nepali civilization. Had the earthquake struck during a weekday afternoon and not a Saturday, tens of thousands of children would have perished. The 2015 earthquake was comparable in magnitude to the one that struck Kathmandu in 1833 which killed about 400 people, as reported in the Journal of Asiatic Society of Bengal by an assistant surgeon to the British residency in Kathmandu. Unlike now, 1833 was the beginning of the end of a generally stable but autocratic tenure of Prime Minister Bhimshan Thapa, lasting more than 30 years. Many Nepalis hoped that 2015 would conclude a drawn out political transition and become a critical juncture in setting the country on a higher path and pace of economic development. Yet, this process remains convoluted, unsettled, and costly. On the morning of April 25, 2015, more than 150 political leaders from the largest party, the Nepali Congress, had assembled at the Diallo Party Palace for a policy orientation. This event had been postponed a few times earlier and had finally managed to assemble a large posse of top leaders, including a deputy prime minister, several cabinet members, and dozens of MPs and former ministers. As a member of the National Planning Commission, the vice chairman and I were about to take turns speaking on the country's development plan and vision when the shaking started at 11.56 a.m. The venue was a one-storied hall with dubious integrity when the pandemonium ensued, people either ducked or headed for the exit, some with light plastic chairs above their head, otherwise composed old men, there were very few women, ran for their lives. I held on to a side door with a plastic frame. The shaking was terrifying, magnified by the violent swinging of an ugly chandelier in the middle of the hall. <laughs> in hindsight, even if the structure had collapsed, it would not have killed most of the politicians. When I narrate this story um, in an informal setting with friends, they say, that would have been a wonderful opportunity. <laughs> and nobody would have gone to prison. For the next hour, people breathed a sigh of relief in a narrow strip of lawn outside. Going through an initial set of more than 300 aftershocks, Nepal went on to experience. Only a few got through to their loved ones at a time when the telecom system was being swamped by millions of calls. Around us, we saw perimeter walls of houses and rooftop water tanks dislodged. I was with Chin Kaji Sresta, an MP from Gorkha, when he got a call from one of his constituents. It's a rout in Gorkha, with virtually all houses collapsed and dust storms across hills as far as one could see. Immediately, my thought went to the village of Bunkot in Gorkha. I wondered what happened to the house I was born in. The image of dust storms also transported me to the Indochina of the 1960s, of carpet bombing of verdant villages that I had read in history books. There I was in Nepal, but thinking about Vietnam. Uh, so it was uh, an interesting emotion. Um, you never know, you know, how your memory dig digs up uh, sort of images um, from the past. Elsewhere in town, the chief secretary of the government of Nepal, Lila Mani Paudel, the top bureaucrat known for his drive and integrity, had just returned home after leading his weekly campaign of cleaning River Bagmati, then in about its hundredth week. 
After failing to reach colleagues on the phone, Powdell asked his son to give him a ride on a motorbike at around 12.30. Powdell scanned the damage as he drove from Maharaj Guns to Singadarbar, the vast campus in the heart of Kathmandu from where Nepal has been administered for over a century. He knew immediately that an emergency protocol had to be put in motion. He was aware that Nepal's greatest existential threat came not necessarily from guns and standing armies, but natural disasters. In the northwest corner of Singadarbar sits the powerful Ministry of Home, and in its shadow, a makeshift structure called the National Emergency Operations Center, NEOC. For the next two weeks, this humble shelter became a symbol of rescue and relief, lean and agile at times, but also chaotic and ill-equipped. It was probably more of an NEIC, an information center, rather than an operation center. When Powdell reached NEOC, he met Baburam Bhandari, an undersecretary, and a few junior staff. More senior officials began to trickle in. Within two hours of the earthquake, proposals were drafted for an emergency meeting of the Central Natural Disaster Relief Committee, chaired by the Home Minister. The decisions included an order to mobilize all resources at the disposal of the state, the right to evacuate people and property forcibly, allocate 500 million rupees immediately to the districts, and categorize the level of the devastation. The cabinet, chaired by the acting prime minister, met soon after and endorsed these measures, among others. Nepal is still governed by the 1982 National Disaster Relief Act, a new bill on disaster management has been stuck in parliament for years. It would have created new regulations and institutions. Fortunately, the National Disaster Response Framework, NDRF, had been in place since 2009, which groups disaster into tiers. The fourth level triggers the involvement of the Home Minister and an automatic call for international assistance. India and China were singled out as countries from which Nepal expected much help. The first Indian Air Force plane carrying relief cargo reached Nepal within six hours. The chief district officers, CDOs, in the affected districts were given instructions to immediately call the district disaster relief committee meetings. A decision was made to set up 16 camps inside Kathmandu Valley for people to take refuge. A team from the prime minister's office was dispatched to the airport to facilitate the entry of foreign search and rescue workers. Towards the evening, Pictures of devastated houses and monuments went viral, including the iconic Dharara, first built by Premier Vim Vimsen Thapa in 1832 and rebuilt after the 1934 quake. The chief secretary returned home to sleep at 1 a.m. the next day. Bar Park in Gorkha had been established as the epicenter of the quake. A Nepal Army helicopter with night visibility that had been sent to Barpak to, Bar to survey the damage came back with the report that about 90% of more than 1,000 houses in the village had collapsed. I had trekked to Barpak five years earlier and was struck by its spectacular location on a neat plateau midway up a very high mountain. Its natives have a long tradition of joining the British or the Indian Army. fighting the Japanese in 1943 was a local boy. On Sunday, April 26th, the command room shifted to the Government Integrated Data Center, GIDC, a sturdier building next to the NEOC. As a member of NPC, a policy advisory body of the government, I was not expected to be there. But the vice chairman, Govinda Pokhrel, and I thought we might lend a helping hand. So by 8.30 a.m., we reached Singadarbar. The main command room on the first floor had the chief secretary manning three cell phones, talking to civil servants in the districts. Sitting opposite him were four senior ministers, somber and awestruck. In the next room, there were about six senior officers from the Nepal army, the police, the armed police force, and the spokesperson of the home ministry. Liaising helicopter search and rescue sorties. The weather that morning was gloomy especially across the Himalayan belt of Gorkha, Dhading, Rasua, Sindhu, Palchok, and Dolakha. 
It was Mahesh Acharya, a senior minister, and I who thought of organizing the flight and rescue information more systematically. Until then, information was being communicated via telephone between Singadarbar and Nepal's modest air force, the number 11 brigade of the Nepalese army stationed at the airport. It's called the Egaranam or Kubaini in Nepali. I collected a few marker paints and white boards and drew columns as follows. District, villas or other, material sent, people airlifted. Soon after, this evolved into a more sophisticated display with listing of urgent requests, arrival of foreign teams, and stations around the Kathmandu Valley for CSSR, Collapsed Structure Search and Rescue. This was the first draft of history. The gravity of the crisis was sinking in at Singadarbar. It occurred to me then why we didn't already have a humming war room with digital screens and real-time information from the districts. Within the first 24 hours, death toll exceeded 2,000. We knew this would multiply. The security forces, young people, and local community leaders had spontaneously begun to dig people out of the rubble, take the injured to the nearest hospital, and clear the debris, often with bare hands. National resilience against a backdrop of material poverty is a recurring theme in Nepal. This came out beautifully in yesterday's discussion by world-class photographers, James Noctwe and Kevin uh, uh, Bubriski. Resilience is about bouncing back. How do Nepalis, in one of the poorest countries of the world, if you ignore North Korea, Nepal is one of the two poorest countries in, a in the Asia Pacific, with, uh, together with Afghanistan. How do Nepalis, in one of the poorest countries of the world, do it time after time, one crisis after another. It could be they have not known any other way. Life has always been gritty and rugged in the mountains. Some might say it is the vast spiritual and cultural reserve and a hint of fatalism that propels us. The natural disasters are still officially referred to as doibi prakop or divine interventions or exertions. When the quake struck, Prime Minister Sushil Koirala was about to land in Bangkok. On his way back from the Asian African Summit in Indonesia, organized to mark the 60th anniversary of the historic Bandung Conference. The chief secretary considered either sending a Nepal Airlines aircraft or chartering a Thai plane to bring him home sooner. The logistics proved difficult and the prime minister returned as scheduled the next day. Upon landing, he came straight to the command center, chaired a cabinet meeting, and spoke to journalists. In an obituary published two weeks ago, after the sudden death of the former prime minister, I wrote, Shushil Koirala embodied old-fashioned political virtues of integrity and conviction. He will be remembered as a decent man who meant well, had good intentions, but did not quite get a grip of the managerial knack needed to make a dent in the complex systems of organizational malfunction in ways that befitted his otherwise exemplary devotion to public service. This verdict was partly shaped by how the government response unfolded, from an inspiring high to disappointment under his watch and got worse under his successor. So this is the first 24 hours. Um, now let me, um, uh, turn to part two of my lecture, which will be more informal. Um, part two is about sort of the big takeaways, uh, from events that un unfolded after that first 24 hours to, um, you know, over the next uh, nine months or so. Um, I'll talk about what worked um, and things that may not be well known uh, to people outside. And, and the critical point when things started to fall apart. Um, and um, part three will be on the lessons uh, learned. So the first takeaway is really that um, the initial triggers of emergency response within the state machinery 
actually worked. But it was grossly ill-equipped and ill-prepared. The fact that uh, in a country like Nepal, with the level of devastation we saw in the Kathmandu Valley, that you would have almost all the key cabinet ministers, the chief secretary of the government of Nepal, at the place where they were supposed to be, according to the guidelines, at the NEOC, happened. I mean, that's something to acknowledge. Within the first two hours, uh, they drafted more than 16 proposals. And they knew exactly the terms of reference of the different committees and the protocol that had to be put in motion at a crisis like this. So the proposals had to be first vetted and cleared by the National Disaster Relief, sorry, the Central Disaster Relief Committee. Um, but it would vet and then submit it to the cabinet. So all these bureaucratic proce procedures, you know, of a, of a sovereign nation, you know, people, we, people don't know even, uh, you know, whether these things exist and whether, you know, somebody just uh, calling the shots uh, from somewhere. So these things actually worked. Um, a few years earlier, the NEOC was actually a recent creation. Just three years earlier, it had been uh, built. Um, there were 83 open spaces that had already been demarcated in the Kathmandu Valley. 16 were, uh, were, um, came into operation, but 83 had actually been demarcated. And uh, we can go back to, uh, to assess why that, why that uh, uh, didn't uh, materialize fully. There was a humanitarian staging area built near the Thiruvavan International Airport. So that worked. The airport didn't stop working. So that was a huge um, uh, plus for the rescue and relief work. And many people don't know this, and I myself was amazed when I heard this. There was actually a dead bodies management guidelines that had been put into place a few years earlier. And if you notice, you go back and think around that period, there was not a single controversy surrounding the claiming of dead bodies from hospitals and the procedures around cremation or decent burial. And this was amazing. And you know, normally, I learned this when I was uh, on the job. But uh, especially in a Hindu Buddhist society, you know, bodies are sacrosanct, and even in other, other religions. And uh, the fact that somebody had actually put these guidelines in place, dead bodies management guidelines, gives you a hint that this was not a clueless government, a clueless state. You know, things had uh, been planned, things had been put in motion, but against a backdrop of the, the, the poverty and the material, uh, material deprivation of the state and the country at large, I think. The state actually, by Sunday, had mobilized all its staff, 90% of the security forces, so that's about 66,000 army, 42,000 police, 25,000 armed police. This was a special force created during the Civil War to fight the Maoists. And we're doing great work now. Um, and 22,500 civil servants. 1,800 officers were immediately sent to the 14 districts, which were the hardest uh, hit districts. There were 17 additional districts that were less affected. Yet the response seemed uh, inadequate. There was no integrated search and rescue capacity. The kind of a disaster response force that was envisioned by the, uh, the bill had been stuck in parliament. So in smaller crises, in smaller disasters, you know, it, it was the army or the police. You know, it was about clearing a landslide or rescuing people from a flood. That scale of disaster relief, uh, the Nepal army had, been, uh, had, uh, had become pretty good at doing. But the scale of the devastation this time, the biggest earthquake in over 80 years, uh, I think the state just couldn't um, get a handle on in immediately, despite mobilizing everything at its disposal. There were lack of tools and heavy equipment for debris clearance. As I mentioned, people were clearing things with hand. And the anger was really over the optics. People were saying, the government is nowhere. But who is the government? Who is the state? It's the army, it's the police, it's the civil servants. What the people were actually referring to were the politicians. So the problem was the politicians were not visible. <coughs> Nobody came forward you know, uh, in a Bill Clinton-esque manner and say, I feel your pain. <laughs> I'm here. Or even Rudy Giuliani. I remember the 9-11 uh, press conferences that Rudy Giuliani did. And this is something for the researchers to look into. Is it something cultural? You know? 
uh, when I pressed a uh, concerned uh, uh, government minister who was the spokesperson, he said, there's nothing new to share. You know, whatever, I've done two press conferences, there's nothing. And I told him uh, quite frankly that, uh, look, the point is not to give information. The point is to show the people that the, that the state is on top of things. The call, just show up at 10 o'clock or 4 o'clock, you know, have a routinized presence, televise it. People will be reassured and assured. He wouldn't budge. Because uh, you know, said, there's nothing to share. You know, it's, uh, things are out already. People know it. And so I think that bit, again, this, is, this will come up uh, on how we manage future crises. But the anger was, you know, when the government was not there, it's really the politicians that, that it was directed at. And the prime minister was unfortunately away at the time, as I mentioned earlier. But the scale of the disaster was so big, and uh, people had immediately talked about, uh, uh, you know, the Katrina disaster here in the United States, the Fukushima disaster in Japan, you know, mighty economies, rich countries, well-equipped countries also struggle with, with, with uh, disasters of this magnitude. So my first takeaway was really that the triggers, the initial protocols worked, but the scale was so big that it appeared inadequate. The second takeaway is really the spontaneous spirit of volunteerism and self-organization by the youth and the Nepali diaspora were of a scale never seen before. And this is something that came out very strongly in the three panels uh, today. This was a tremendously positive result of a shifting demographics in a globalized era. Nepal is a shockingly young country. Half the country is uh, below the age of 21. The median age is 21. Um, voters, young voters, between 18 and 40, comprise of more than 60% of the, of the voting mass. So if this cohort can be excited with uh, the right kind of leadership, a visionary leadership, I think uh, Nepal can really um, make a leapfrog and change pretty rapidly. Now the full force of the expanding diaspora also was evident as individuals and groups from the US and Canada, Europe, Korea, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, as well as the Gulf countries where many of the temporary migrants uh, go, they contributed in a huge way. Many youth groups immediately organized relief uh, efforts and went to the districts despite objections from parents who were terrified of the aftershocks and the landslides. So anyone familiar with the Nepali landscape would know that what a, what a, what a risky affair this was to lead convoys and um, things into these perilous mountains. And you never know when the landslide is going to come. Many young groups, they wanted to align their work with that of the government, but there was no such window at the time. Uh, but we at the National Planning Commission were trying to improvise and create some of these windows uh, on the go. There was nothing institutionalized, nothing routinized. We do have uh, a National Development Volunteer Service, NDVS, and uh, what we did was whoever was interested in getting the government logo on their arm, armband or on their wrist, the legitimacy mattered, you see. I mean, there were hundreds of groups uh, organizing themselves and going and saying, we're helping, we're here to help. But if you had that Nepal government logo, you know, no matter how maligned and uh, sort of discredited the government is, people still craved that logo, that Nepal government logo, that tells you about the legitimacy of the, of the state and uh, things like that. So we did that for thousands of young, young, young volunteers who approached us. And this was almost a costless thing for us. We did sign a little MOU and said, uh, you know, look, we're not, if you die or if you get injured, there's, not, there's no liability on the part of the state. This is, uh, but we are happy to lend you that legitimacy and, and go and go ahead and do, do that work. But not everyone had pure intentions. I think uh, immediately within the, I think the uh, Bizet uh, in the earlier presentation highlighted this issue. We had uh, foreign rescue teams showing up at the airport and demanding to be rescued themselves. Where's the vehicle for me? Where's the, you know, where are the government officials? Who is escorting me to where? where, where which hotel am I staying? in Barpak, you know. So, <laughs> so that kind of <coughs> tension, it is mutual, you know. So it is two-way. The state appeared irritated or even hostile to NGOs that did not self-initiate, self-organize, or self-deliver. And some are very professional. The Red Cross, you know, they knew how to, you know, how to get going in circumstances like this. Much of the relief work uh, saw the problem of the last mile. 
the more accessible VDCs, the villages just near the highway or near the district headquarters, benefited much, much more than those farther away. Stories of proximate villages stocking up uh, supplies, relief materials for up to six months uh, started to trickle in within the first week. Whereas those just behind, just 10 minutes away, would have received nothing. To ensure better targeting, a heroic effort combining local knowledge and organizational skills was needed. Most external groups just did not have the fortitude or patience. With the credit secured for the easier leg, the problem of the last mile was left for the local administration to solve, which was already stretched. There was almost a picnic mentality in some of the relief work. The government failed by not uh, issuing sort of a list of goods that was in demand, tents, for example, tarpaulins. So all relief agencies, charities from abroad and within Nepal decided to pack things that they thought would be important. So in Gorkha and Dhading, I came across canned tuna fish, even saris, you know, bridal saris, <laughs> um, snacks, and very expensive bottles of mineral water. Food in central Nepal means actually rice. If you can help, you can add a little bit of oil. And if it is in the northern belts, like Raswa, Dhading, where salt is also very important. But these kind of basic things, the state was, of course, unable to guide. But a lot of self-discipline was also absent. In Nepal, people usually thought of the VDCs, the Village Development Committees, as the smallest unit of governance. Yet this was too big, actually, when it came to the relief, relief uh, work. Help really had to be managed at the level of settlements or hamlets. And so ensuring an equitable distribution was a challenge. And most people were handpicking or dropping off stuff by roadside, which didn't actually help. But the overall spirit was really one of generosity, extraordinary initiatives, um, and total commitment, and, and this drive, on, especially on the part of young people and the diaspora. I think that has been well documented and well, well received. Now, the state appeared stuffy and inflexible in matching this outpouring of external support. The bureaucracy is not designed for flexibility or facilitation. They are bound by stiff rules, perverse incentives, and hierarchy. They are risk averse and usually don't make on the spot decisions. There's so called hacking culture in Nepal. You, let, you, you pass the buck to the boss. And um, maybe this will come up in the question and answer session. But the current incentive structure is so perverted that if you don't do anything, if the civil servants don't do a thing, you have your automatic promotion. You know, you're due for your automatic promotion after a few years. If you take some risk, if you, if you take a decision, if you want to move a file forward, if you want to do something, you just might get into trouble. So why would you take, you know, be active and, uh, and, and take that decision? There were some well-intentioned initiatives on the part of the government. The one-door policy, for example, it was precisely to ensure that equitable distribution. If you made it free for all, people knew what would happen. You know, it would be the roadside settlements. And in fact, I myself led a relief truck to my village in Bungkot. I was stopped at the, at the entry. And uh, even though I was well known and you know, this was my home village, I, couldn't, I knew the guys who were at the, at the, at the entry point had been sort of amassing a lot of relief material. And I knew there was just in, uh, 45 minutes away, ward, yeah. ward number nine. You know, there are nine wards in a village. This is ward number one. I knew ward number nine was desperately in need for relief material. Even I couldn't take it there. So this was sort of, uh, you know, the people's, the simplistic notion of, uh, you know, uh, these uh, innocent victims. I think uh, the way people were behaving was uh, the evil side also came out. So, so things that were designed in good faith actually also backfired. Um, what struck me was, you know, the state collects an amazing array of data you know, in Nepal, from citizenship to land ownership certificates. Election commission has data on everyone, age, sex, how many family members, who can vote, who is migrating where. There are land survey offices. They have cadastral maps. 
of your location of your houses, how much land you have, and so much of social security allowances. You know, the deprived communities, the Dalits, the, uh, the folks in Karnali, for example, they receive a lot of, uh, Nepal actually spends the highest share of its gross domestic product in social security allowances. It's one of the poorest countries in South Asia, but nearly 3% is of its GDP is spent on social security. Widows allowances, old, old people's pensions. If you put it all together, a lot of waste, a lot of leakage, of course, but if you all put it together, it's one of the most generous welfare states in a, in, a, in a poor country. So there's a lot of data at the disposal of the state, but it's not harmonized and unified and integrated. So when it came to actually reaching the neediest, the state failed, because there's no information. And this is, again, a lesson that we need to turn to you know, how do we design the scientific smart cards? And so when the next crisis hits, you know, you know you, you, everything is automated, digitized, uh, made electronic, and this is where the new technologies uh, will, be, will, be, uh, will need to be marshaled. Fourth takeaway, the absence of local governments was a huge vacuum, and it hamstrung effective relief. Again, a legacy of the conflict, armed conflict period. Nepal has had a uh, local government vacuum for over 12 years. The absence of over 200,000 local office bearers aggravated this void. In each village now, there's one humble clerk called the Gaon Vikas Samiti Ko Sachib, a Gaon Gavisa Sachib, a junior clerk. He is the, he or she, she, rarely she, but he is the state at the village level. But the government is not a homogeneous entity, and coordination, I think, was a slightly better on the ground and in the districts than in Kathmandu itself. Because at least in the districts, the CDO's authority reigned supreme. In the capital, the home ministry was not the only center of power. There are lots of different prime minister's office, the National Planning Commission, the Ministry of uh, Finance, Ministry of, and the sectoral ministries all want to, want to have, a, uh, have a say. But, um, in the districts, it's the, center, the CDO is sort of the king there. Um, and uh, he can, uh, in a typical district, there are 30 sort of state uh, offices, you know, irrigation, health, education, all the district education officer, district um, uh, ir um, agriculture officer, health officer. So what happened was the CDOs were immediately telling these guys that you stop your day-to-day -day work, come over, and uh, we have to do this. So he was in charge of the District Disaster Relief Committee, and the CDO could assign portfolios. So when I visited Gorkha in about the eighth day after the earthquake, the guy in charge of irrigation in Gorkha was, was, uh, had the task of managing the English-speaking crowd. So that was his job. You know, he would show up at 8.30, <coughs> so anyone who needed to speak English and know where, you know, need to ask for directions where to go, that was his job. So this kind of improvisation you know, at the district level was happening. A lot of additional personnel who had poured in uh, from other districts. And uh, I told you about the enormity of the task where, you know, that I felt when I uh, was in Singadarwar first. The second time it hit me was again in Gorkha. When I met these two somber policemen who, were, uh, who had been seconded from Pohara, who finished the task of recording the scale of destruction of all households in one village, the village of Namzung, and they told me. So they would go to every house and just record very informally uh, what was the scale of the damage, how many livestock had been lost, how, uh, the quantity of grain that had been uh, buried, and things like that. And they told me, these two guys, when I met them, they had just finished this task in just one village of Namzung, and they told me it took them six days to do that, record keeping. Now imagine there were 500 villages like that. So two guys working 15 hours, you know, for 15 hours a day, took them six days to just to keep basic records. So that, for me, that was sort of, it really hit me. Uh, my God, this is massive. This is huge. You know. There was a PR disaster, definitely, on the part of the government. Serious misunderstanding were allowed to fester on the social media. There was no concerted effort to explain or refute. I think the question came up in the panel today, the negative side of social media. 
extremely damaging rumors were circulated on the social media and uh, propagated by the Nepali diaspora, uh, which were factually incorrect from the get-go. You know. Then they would embellish, and uh, it, was, it was amazing. But the big mistake was not to have that earthquake czar, who appeared every day, at, as I mentioned earlier, at a, at a defined hour, and uh, just to assure the public that we're on top of things. And um, so what, when I saw this vacuum, it was not my job actually, but I thought maybe I should be the unofficial spokesman of the government of Nepal. So I turned my Facebook page into, for a couple of months, into just posting detailed factual information on the procedures. I would call the relevant person and say, I'm going to put your mobile number on my Facebook page. So people, you, you, may, be, you may get 2,000 calls, but I am going to do it. <laughs> so for about two months, this is not my role. I, sh I might have got into trouble. I could easily have been asked by uh, any of the senior cabinet ministers, who the hell are you? Why are you doing this? But I just thought, uh, you know, if no one is doing it, and there's so much miscommunication, which is damaging, which may even be costing lives, I better do it. So there were a few issues I'll just uh, mention to you. There's a big rumor on, for example, oh, the government of Nepal is so callous, so um, unresponsive, possibly corrupt, that it's even taxing relief materials. I immediately checked with the Ministry of Finance, and uh, the, rule, the thing was uh, the, the, there was no organized relief materials would be taxed. Nepal actually signed a model agreement on relief consignments with the United Nations. So any agency, Oxfam or Red Cross, that were sort of uh, party to this agreement on the relief uh, consignments uh, since 2007, they could just move, come in and move their things through. All the new groups, new charities, uh, that were bringing in relief material. They had to declare in a simple form uh, what you brought, in which district you intended to distribute your goods. You did not need to pay any taxes or duty at the airport, but your records would be kept. You go to the district. After you do your delivery and, and, and relief exercises, you get some kind of a note from the district uh, officer that uh, the relief material were distributed. And, um, and within the, you, you, you could get uh, up to 30 days to, to do that. And so these were the basic procedures, but this was never communicated. So people were really angry that how could, at a time like this, at a crisis like this, how could a government be collecting taxes? Now, if you talk to the Ministry of Finance people, they were terrified of the revenue losses because this thing was not trivial. You know? It is 20% VAT, uh, sorry, 20% customs duty on average on many of these things. On top of that is 13%. The risk, the fear that these Ministry of Finance guys had was if we just make it free for all, the state would collapse in terms of you know, uh, you know, three months of re revenue not being collected would be a disaster. So that was their point. So they said, you know, in any country, if you show up at the border, you tell that country who you are, what you brought, and uh, what the purpose is. So this is the minimal documentation is required. But all these things, very simple things, were not communicated. So there was a lot of anger and miscommunication that was circulating. I tried to clear this. The second big misinformation was on the Prime Minister's Disaster Relief Fund. The British newspaper, a very noted British newspaper, The Telegraph, even ran a headline that funds from this relief fund would be siphoned off to a political party. And many Nepalis ran a sort of Facebook campaign asking not to donate to the Prime Minister's Disaster Relief Fund. Now again, there's the Prime Minister's Disaster Relief Fund and there's the Prime Minister's Assistance Fund. Now the Prime Minister's Assistance, now people just equated the two. Prime Minister's Assistance Fund is notorious for being a slush fund. It's one of the possibly two funds that is not audited by the Office of the Auditor General in Nepal. It's one of those little perks that you enjoy uh, as a prime minister or a home minister to distribute money, to, uh, to exercise your judgment on who to give the money to. Now, we all know that uh, 
a uh, lot of this money is actually given to party activists and, and, and as, as favors. But, um, uh, but this is one of those funds that's not audited and not scrutinized. For the Prime Minister Disaster Fund, the Prime Minister has no say over it. It's actually chaired, that committee is chaired by the Vice Chairman of the National Planning Commission with eight secretaries of the government of Nepal. And each decision is unanimously made. So if they say Dolakha needs to be sent this much in advance before they procure the things, then you just decide and you, 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 you send it. And it's supposed to be a fast track mechanism. In the government process, the bureaucracies are so slow, no need for tenders and bids and you know 60 day notices, you just release the money. And in fact, the two crore rupees, the 20 million rupees that was sent overnight to each of the districts was used to make all the initial purchases. You know, the NGOs took days and weeks to land in the districts. But the CDO had that authority from the 26th of April to procure things that he or she uh, thought was necessary. To this day, I think the Prime Minister's Disaster Relief Fund has a website. You can Google Office of the Prime Minister. I can challenge anyone that the open transparency and the detailed breakdown of how much money was given, how much money was assigned to which district, how much was spent, I think that detailed sort of uh, transparency, I haven't seen a comparable standard of bookkeeping in any of the NGOs in Nepal. So even now, if you go today, you go to the Prime Minister's office and look at that website, you will know that six billion rupees were collected and 15 billion rupees were uh, spent or at least allocated. Now the final efficacy of the spending, we don't know yet and that's for the local groups to verify. But at, least at the level of bookkeeping, you know, who gave what? From Gulf, from Korea, from Hong Kong, the billionaires, the government of Bhutan was the first one to give a million dollars. So um, all transparent. Yet this was portrayed as this corrupt slush fund. If we give it money to this, the politicians are going to eat it away. Again, this was not refuted. This was not explained. The rumor just um, um, went around like wildfire and did a, did a big damage because this fund does not have overhead costs. Unlike the NGOs who take at least 15, 20% of the cut. Very economical. From tomorrow, you could use this fund. And a lot of lives were saved because this fund existed. Yet, the portrayal was just the opposite, that this is for the politicians. There was another rumor on whether the bank withdrawals were restricted and things like that. There was one misstep, though. And we had a little bit of a policy um, disagreement with the governor of the central bank. One announcement. Haiti was looming large at the time. So the governor of the central bank was told by some uh, academic that uh, in Haiti, $6 billion were pledged, and in the end, they could only show results for a substantially lower amount. And, uh, and, and the tendency there was, you know, after the disaster, all these shops would open, uh, help Haiti or help Nepal kind of uh, relief. Money would be collected. And uh, nobody knows where that money was spent. And so the intention was good, but I, I personally disagreed with the timing of it. Uh, the directive was also not communicated well. And it said basically any bank account with the name of, you know, attached to the Nepal earthquake of, uh, of April 25th, opened after April 25th, that money would be seized and deposited in the government account. It sounded sinister. Sounded like a you know a, a robbery. Yet the purpose was not to let new groups for established charities, established NGOs. This was not a non-issue. You already had a bank account running. You could collect as much money as you wanted. You could do the relief work and uh, uh, distribution. But for the new account creators, many of whom might be looking to cash in on the disaster, I think the purpose was, hey, don't do that. Use existing funds. Yet. It was not managed well, and, uh, and that the result was, again, since this was not communicated properly, the flow of funds stopped. People just hang on. If I'm giving money in good faith, uh, but this money might go into uh, the government's fund, which, by the way, is for the political parties. So all this sort of conflation um, um, at a time of flux and crises was, did, did, did a lot of damage. 
Another takeaway, international response was exceptionally generous, led by India and China, but immense goodwill in countries like Thailand reconfirmed Nepal's special brand in the world. India, a giant neighbor to our south, looms large in everything we do in Nepal. But just before the earthquake, Narendra Modi, the prime minister, had visited Nepal twice. The previous prime minister who ruled India for 10 years did not visit once, even once. He created, he spoke, he addressed the parliament. There was this new shift, all that sort of distrust of our older, uh, bigger uh, neighbor just melted away with Narendra Modi's visits to Nepal. Immense goodwill uh, he generated and became instantly very popular. Against that backdrop uh, came India's overwhelmingly generous response. This was breathtaking in, in its generosity and, and the scale of um, sort of the support. There were 10 National Disaster Response Forces, one Army Engineering Task Force, 18 Army Medical Units dispatched within 24 hours. The Army operations were led by a Major General, Air Force by a Vice Air Marshal. NDRF rescued 11 persons alive and retrieved 132 bodies within the first week. Not many people know, uh, the power grid, so it is not just the military and the army and the security forces, the power grid corporation, you know these dull electricians from Delhi, showed up in Kathmandu and restored 85% of our power supply within three days. There were eight Mi-17, these giant Russian helicopters and five advanced light helicopters of the Indian army that did almost half the sorties it was not just the state, but there was immense outpouring of support from the Indian provinces. Not the Indian central government, but also the provinces. There were community kitchens run from Punjabi and Haryana NGOs, the state governments. 318 buses were sent by the government of Uttar Pradesh to evacuate people out of Kathmandu, mainly Indians, but also Nepalis. And uh, they were to subsequently pledge a billion dollars uh, in, um, in uh, earthquake reconstruction, 25% of it was grant, and uh, another billion dollars was pledged by Narendra Modi the previous year, and they converted 40% of that into grant. So this is, and even the, the loan part is concessional, this 1, 2% interest rate. Prime Minister Modi asked his closest advisor, Dr. P.K. Mishra, who had actually overseen the reconstruction of Gujarat after the 2001 earthquake, when Modi was the chief minister of Gujarat. The main guy there, Dr. P.K. Mishra, was appointed the point man to help Nepal's reconstruction. And Dr. P.K. Mishra, who is uh, a special advisor to Prime Minister Modi even now, probably one of two closest advisors, came to Nepal personally and met us. And uh, he sent his most trusted advisor, Dr. Thiru, to work uh, with the National Planning Commission and me in particular. And this sort of the softer part of diplomacy, the, the skills, the goodwill, the personal relationships uh, that was established, I think went on to help us immensely uh, in, 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 the, in, in the extraordinary pledging that India made uh, in, the, in the donor conference. So this is at the level of state. China also expressed its generosity in a similar manner. I found myself in Thailand after a few, um, few weeks, I think. And what struck me in Thailand was, uh, of course, the government helped. Uh, um, the, the Thai king and uh, the monarchy, the, you know, the old ties with the Nepal used to be a monarchy. Um, they, they pledged very generous amounts of money. But there, the stories that touched me were, you know, these Thai school children mailing hundreds of letters with about 50 baht, which is about $1, 50 cents, for the people of Nepal. They were mailing these letters with money, 50 baht, to the Nepalese embassy in Bangkok. All the taxi drivers, if you, if you get into a taxi and say you are from Nepal, no fare for you, free ride. <laughs> All the shopping malls running campaigns to you know, uh, collect donations uh, for Nepal. And uh, the ambassador there was really amazed. Uh, we've never seen some uh, you know, a generosity or outpouring of generosity of this kind. And people were saying maybe this was the Buddhist affinity. You know, Thailand is famously Buddhist, uh, 
and the fact that Lumbini is in Nepal probably had that connection. There were several organizations that rose to the occasion with versatile talent and creativity. People were really improvising. The limitations of the state were evident, and people were trying to find how they can contribute. So I'll give you two examples. Very interesting, and this is probably not well known. EC Mold, the Integrated Center for, uh, International Center for Integrated Mountain Development. It's, it's an international institute in, based in Kathmandu. Um, they look at um, you know, almost like the UN kind of institute, but for just for the eight or nine countries that share the Himalayas or the Hindu Kush mountains. Uh, it's about, um, of course, environmental protection, but also um, sustaining livelihoods in, in the mountain regions. Now, it turns out they have excellent maps. So when these Indian pilots and later the American pilots showed up at Tribhuvan International Airport, they were rather arrogant. They said, we don't need your help. You're in Nepal. We're coming here to help you. We have our own maps. We have our own fancy gadgets, GPS, this and that. Um, we know, just tell us where to go. Melamchi, Barpak, Laprak, Gumda, Keronza, where? Where do you want us to go? We'll go. But it turned out their maps and their gadgets were useless in Nepal. So a team from Isimod, actually a good friend of mine, Parneko Pandey, an MIT-trained uh, atmospheric scientist, they just very informally set up an office there at the airport at the number 11 brigade, um, set up their internet, started the Google Earth uh, going, and um, um, projecting them on big screens and helping with the drop-off points in remote locations, uh, identifying landing sites, and, uh, and uh, mapping potential flight paths, and um, calculating load limits of the helicopters. And uh, they would provide these pilots with uh, color printouts of customized maps and 3D sort of terrain images. One morning, Google Earth was down. So one of the guys uh, I was told, who is uh, now at MIT, called up his friend in, in, in California and said, can we get the server back up? And uh, it was done through Skype. So all these informal networks of, you know, the world is one small place now. Everything is connected. And after that call, not only was the server back, but the maps on Nepal were made available much more frequently, the updated maps by Google Earth. There was also helicopter politics. The British wanted to uh, bring their Chinooks. The government of Nepal denied them permission. Now, there was a huge uproar on this. Some people think the British Prime Minister even called the Nepal Prime Minister and said, you know, we want our, our Chinooks to be in Kathmandu. But, uh, the, but the Chinooks were um, are huge, and they were, it would have been very difficult to land in narrow strips. And uh, I think, um, but the undercurrent, the, the, the real reason, and this is speculation on many people's part, that uh, it was the Nepal army that pressured the government of Nepal to refuse British planes because one of, uh, one of their former cor cornels um, um, had been indicted by the British army for war crimes. and So all these things, you know, you would think everything is benign. Like there's a helicopter want, wanting to come into Nepal with loads of supplies. Why would it be stopped? You know? uh, so there's undercurrents, there's politics, the disaster politics, uh, very much at work. The Chinese, uh, they came in, um, and the Nepalese welcomed the Chinese arrival because the big fear was, how long are the Indians going to stay? But they didn't have enough space in the Trivuvan International Airport. They were asked to go to Khari Party in Bhaktapur. They didn't like it. So the Chinese actually went up to their border in Kerum, Raswagadi. You know. So they would fly in, in, a, in perfect formation into Kathmandu. And I was told that uh, they didn't speak English. So they were not of much use. Um, one uh, English translator would accompany them in, in a helicopter. and. Um, very difficult language, uh, language issues. And uh, um, uh, so, but the Chinese, as I said, it was a welcome, pre uh, you know, uh, their, their presence was a welcome uh, reprieve for Nepalese because this was used very to delicately sort of counterbalance the Indian heavy handedness at times. 
U.S. Ospreys, the Americans came with their own toys. <laughs> Multi-mission tilt rotors you know, that does the lift and the propulsion in, at the same time. Not very useful at high altitude. So they were sent to sort of uh, to carry cargo at the, at the lower altitude. And the perception <laughs> was that the Americans were really testing their toys. Would it work in a terrain like Nepal? The most useful the helicopters, and by the way, there was a tragic incident with the American Huey, Huey helicopter, which crashed. And um, in fact, that created a, a very tragedy, of course. Six Americans, American Marines, and two Nepalese perished in that crash. But uh, so much of our attention was devoted to tracing the site of the crash and rescuing the remains that the actual relief work was also hurt. So there was some resentment. So, you know, it's not black and white. You know, there's a lot of gray in this work. People with good intentions, countries with good intentions coming in, yet they're, you know, often it backfired. Indian and Nepali MI-17s were most suited to the terrain. And um, so, so it was the ECMO team, these, uh, you know, rookies who ended up actually saving uh, Nepal's uh, image and prestige in the, in, the, uh, in the eyes of all these uh, foreign pilots. And, and they ended up being very useful, very, uh, very professional. Uh, very savvy, and, uh, but the, and and with even with more scientific weather forecasts, but the Nepal government's uh, sort of Department of Hydrology and Meteorology was deeply upset. They said, you know, but anyone, any Nepalese, uh, you know, who are used to the weather forecasts of the Department of Hydrology, <laughs> so there's a chance of rain today. You know, <laughs> completely useless <laughs> when it comes to um, thing. the second example of this improvising was really the crowdsourcing. Uh, I think this has been talked about, so I'm not going to say, but Kathmandu Living Labs and all these other, other tools, fantastic work. But the government was clueless on the kind of, you know, the positive force that could be. Uh, so whatever work was being done was being done in isolation, in parallel. Great work was being accomplished. But I think the challenge, the lesson for the future is how to integrate this, how to educate the bureaucrats who are <coughs> making decisions and planning from a high level to get this feeded. And when I was at the National Planning Commission, I. Well, I quite championed the, the whole open data movement and uh, was trying to open up the government books, government data, make it downloadable in Stata and Excel and let people download, you know, use and, um, for, for the larger common good. So this is sort of the relief and the rescue phase. In the early recovery phase, this is when the National Planning Commission, where I was part of, actually came, had been tasked with quite heavy, heavy duties. We had to uh, prepare the PDNA, the post-disaster needs assessment. And uh, in hindsight, it has now become an exemplary exercise. But there was, again, a risk of a high tea going on. You know. Each agency, when the government is weak, you step in and you sort of weaken the legitimacy of the state. And you have five big donors, the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, the UN, the EU, coming in and doing their own assessments, marginalizing and, uh, and completely bypassing the state. And uh, there's one disaster, but there would be five assessments. So this is when I, again, sort of um, spoke to some of the key ministers and the vice chairman and said, this can't, this shouldn't uh, happen in Nepal. And we should take charge. The National Planning Commission should check charge. And I will take charge from within the National Planning Commission. So this was, uh, this kept us busy for about six weeks. I summoned all the, um, all the heads of agencies there is a standard methodology on how to do a post-disaster needs assessment, PDNA, devised by the UN, EU, and the World Bank. But uh, we decided to add the Asian Development Bank and JICA, the Japanese, for being very important development partners for Nepal. Um, and um, immediately, um, after the second quake of May 12th, uh, we assembled all these experts, all these donor agencies, Around 500 experts were summoned to Hotel Radisson and they were oriented on the PDNA methodology. The government really asserted, and on behalf of the government, it was the National Planning Commission, and said, there is one disaster, there will just be one assessment, and it will be the government of Nepal's assessment, and you are supposed to help, help us do this. So when the government came forward with a very credible plan and uh, sort of a series of uh, steps and a clear deadline of April of June 25th, when we would present these results to all the international donors, everything fell into place. But it was a risky affair. It could have gone horribly wrong. We created 23 groups, around 500 experts from 30 development partners, 
but each group was led by the Nepal government officer, joint secretary. So it was very important to have that ownership and that leadership so that after these experts leave, uh, that uh, the government still retained the ownership. So we did this assessment very quickly, um, but it was highly credible. All the assumptions were made very transparent. So we came up with a figure of $5 billion damage, $2 billion losses, economic losses, and $6.7 billion of early recovery needs. Um, a 500-page report was produced within five weeks of international quality. The Central Bureau of Statistics was an unsung hero in this whole exercise. People were going around and saying, oh, you know, the, I, um, I expect the losses to be 20 billion or 25 billion, just out of thin air. There's no basis. So the Central Bureau of Statistics, which fortunately was under my watch at the National Planning Commission, I summoned the Director General and said, please mobilize your machinery, and I want an assessment of output losses to this year's GDP for 83 days. I want a figure from April 25th to July 15th when the current fiscal year ends. So it was that work, that sort of the background number crunching, and a clear basis on how these output losses were estimated that ended up making the PDNA exercise extremely credible. But we knew that a credible PDNA, the post-disaster needs assessment, would not be enough. We needed to convince donors that we could actually spend the money that we were asking. The problem in Nepal is we don't spend the money even in a normal budget year. Right? So we knew the first question we would get from the donors and the development partners was, but you don't even spend the money that you have. How are you going to spend this extra $7 billion over the next five years? Or at least half that amount, which was for public sector needs. So we needed to assure them that uh, we will spend the money. And to do so, we would create an extraordinary mechanism, EOM. So this was, again, another in second initiative of ours. So we told them, we will do everything. We will enshrine all the powers in this mechanism that we know have been obstructing the normal delivery of development funds um, in a normal year. So we would make the position of the CEO very powerful. We would fast track all the procedures that hold back spending. And there are four major bottlenecks in normal development spending in Nepal. Rules related to procurement, rules related to land acquisition, rules related to environmental impact assessments, and rules related to grievance redressal mechanisms. All these had fast track provisions built into this, uh, this, uh, this mechanism. And, and the whole earlier, uh, there were lots of development partners egging us on to, you know, why don't you use the Indonesia model? Why don't you use the Kashmir model? We said, no, we have Nepali experiences to draw on. We have experimented with EOMs, extraordinary mechanisms in the past. There was uh, the 1988 earthquake in Nepal, in eastern, eastern Nepal, which even end up, ended up winning international prizes for, uh, for, um, for, um, uh, for an effective reconstruction. There was the big fire in the Manglung Bazaar in Tirathum district in 2002. And the, and, the, and the integration of the Maoist combatants after 2006. These are all examples of Nepali homegrown success stories of an extraordinary mechanism in action. We said, we're going to use those. And, uh, and that, that was what informed the design of the National Reconstruction Authority. So with these two things in place, the International Conference on Nepal's Reconstruction, which was essentially the donors conference, exactly two months after the disaster on June 25th, ended up becoming a grand success. The norm is to secure maybe 15, 20, 30 percent of your needs. In Nepal, we secured 100% of our public needs. The total need was $6.7 billion, but half of it was related to private housing. The public sector needs were about $3.8 billion. The pledge we received was more than $4 billion. There was not a single doubt expressed on the credibility and the quality of the assessment that we did. And, um, and Nepal had not hosted such a grand international summit at a time when aftershocks were so frequent, it was just two months after the thing. We've hosted SARC summits, these are seven or eight heads of governments, but here we had 60 very senior people, the Foreign Minister of China, Foreign Minister of India, President of the Asian Development Bank, EU Commissioner, and, uh, and other dignitaries. So up to the first two months, I think things were picking up, the momentum was there, there was a lot of excitement, 
on the success of the international conference. Then I think we became a victim of our own success. This, the grand success of the ICNR, the international conference, suddenly people started to notice that, hang on, there's all these billions of dollars. Who is going to be in charge of this? And whoever is in charge of this will emerge as uh, the next leader of Nepal, if you can pull it off. So politics started to creep in within the Nepali Congress party, which led the government, and also the coalition partner. The CEO had all the power and the money. So the CEO would have been at the rank of a minister. So with all these fast track provisions, here's a powerful minister working closely with the prime minister, could get things done very fast, swiftly, could show results in six months, in one year. So if it was an honest, competent guy, he really, he or she, would really have pulled off miracles. Then the MPs, the members of parliament from the concerned districts, wanted to have their own say. Hang on, it's billions of dollars. I want a, I, I want a share. I, I want to have a say over how that money is used in my district. Fine from a democratic perspective, but I think not all intentions were benign. The coalition politics crept in. The UML, the United Marxist Leninists, knew that in two months' time it would come to power. So why would you let this all-powerful CEO, who couldn't be removed for at least two years, be appointed now, if it is coming to power in, in two, two or three months' time, after the constitution, new constitution, that was sort of the so-called gentleman's agreement uh, for the, new prime, the current prime minister to come in. So all these factors started to come in. There were intra-party uh, wrangling and uh, all, these, all these issues sort of delayed the appointment of the CEO of the NAR. So we began to lose momentum after that. Still after six weeks of the conference, the CEO was finally appointed. And, um, and the vice chairman of the National Planning Commission, Mr. Dr. Pokhril, who I had worked with, was, I think, well placed to, um, since he was in, involved from day one, he was a good uh, nominee. Um, and he started, he continued the work, because then NPC had, had been uh, taking the lead in many of the reconstruction work anyway. And we had started to work with the reconstruction policy. What would be the philosophy of reconstruction? What, what, is, what are the objectives? What are the principles? What are the strategies? And what are the activities? So all these things were being worked out. Um, there were eight key principles. I don't think I have time. I've taken much more time than I uh, thought. So I don't want to. But we clearly worked out a very coherent, consistent set of principles. And this is how reconstruction shall proceed in Nepal. So the NPC was filling the void on, uh, until the time the Reconstruction Authority came and became fully functional. So a lot of work. We worked on the temporary shelter models, how a permanent settlement should look like, how many settlements needed to be moved, where, uh, all the earthquake-resistant features, incorporating these principles of build back better and uh, um, use of local skills and materials, gender, disability-friendly, clean energy, um, in, done in a participatory way. So all these sort of state-of-the-art things you know, that uh, needed to be incorporated were envisioned and put in the recon draft reconstruction policy. So once the authority came into being, this thing would be um, taken forward. And then the unthinkable happened. The new CEO's term expired after two weeks. And nobody knew this was coming. The National Reconstruction Authority had to be put in place before the donors' conference, otherwise there wouldn't have been any credible pledging. To do that, the parliament was not in sitting. So this is, for the American audience, this might be odd, but this is sort of a British Westminster democracy in action. When the parliament is not there, you issue an ordinance. The president issues an ordinance. But whatever the president is issuing uh, in the form of an ordinance has to be ratified within 60 days by the parliament. So the government, uh, once the parliament resumed after the conference, registered the, uh, the ordinance in the parliament, and it was, um, it was um, ratified, and that, ra and that ordinance had to be converted into an act of law, in a, in a bill, formal bill. 
and everybody assumed that this had taken a normal parliamentary course. Yet, on the 60th day, there was no bill. So there are a lot of uh, conspiracy theories in Kathmandu on uh, how this happened. Was it carelessness on the part of the Ministry of Law or the Minister of Law? Was it a deeper conspiracy on the part of the Speaker of the House who didn't let this come through and get it passed? But the result was the momentum stopped and, uh, and uh, the CEO no longer existed because um, his leg legitimacy, I mean, uh, it, it was non-existent. And then the constitution was, uh, the country started to focus more on the constitution, this urgency to issue the constitution, and, um, and, and they did work on it. So this was, so April 25th, May 25th, June 25th was the donors conference. It took six weeks to appoint the CEO. The CEO appointment uh, became void on, on August 25th, so exactly four months after that, the attention, the national mood, the priority of the political leaders shifted towards issuing this new Republican constitution. Again, that, has, uh, that was uh, still mated for almost seven years. The heavy handedness on the part of the big parties in ramming this through created a full blown unrest in the Madhes, in the southern plains. And there was a blockade along the India Nepal border with the tacit blessing of the Indian government. This was a spectacular volta face and an exercise of a very blunt instrument on the part of the Indian government that had acted in extraordinary gen generosity just a few months earlier. The lack of essential fuel, food, medicine, all vital projects stalled. When there's no fuel, Nepal currently goes through 12 to 14 to 16 hours of load shedding. Without diesel, you can't even run electricity. Without, without diesel generators, you can't, you can't do anything. But this external intervention diverted the focus of the people from internal incompetence to external interference. So Nepalis were not blaming the Nepali government. They, were bl they started to blame India for the slow reconstruction, for, uh, for everything bad that was happening in the country. And the new government played this to its advantage. The delay also pushed up the number of fake earthquake victims. People, were, people who were not eligible for um, you know, whose house was not destroyed. Suddenly there were 50%, 60% increase uh, in, 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 in the creation of these IDs uh, of earthquake victims because there's a lot of talk of free money, concessional money over the next few years. So in the face of unresponsive politics, we lost precious months to inaction, deflection, and disaster neglect. The new government was formed on the Oct October 12th. Um, the new CEO was finally appointed on December 25th from, that, from the new party from the new government. But he was hamstrung because there were allegations that he actually did not meet the formal qualifications to be the CEO because uh, you needed 15 years of experience. A lot of the senior civil servants refused to go and work in the authority. So despite these supreme powers and fast track provisions to really show results, to get things done on the ground, the authority is still not functional. Um, all the staff who are supposed to work in the authority are supposed to be deputed from other different government ministries. Of the 208 staff authorized by the Minister of General Administration, only 30 have reported so far. None of the 13 joint secretaries at the senior level have been assigned. And a um, lot of delay and this sort of problems of mental disorder, fake victims, um, and, and reassessments of damage as a condition of some large assistance that had been placed by bigger development partners like the World Bank. So this is the state of play. This is where we are. From those um, inspiring highs to disappointments to the current failure. Let me conclude with a few big lessons. I think the April 25th, 2015, um, earthquake was not the big one. The big one is yet to come. If you follow the seismic cycle, of course, these things can't be predicted. But there have been really big ones, the huge ones, every 200, 300 years. 1255, 1505, 1934. 
So we need to create, we need to prepare for the big one, legislatively, administratively, materially, and internalize the principles of risk management. The disaster management authority needs to be um, created. There needs to be a full-time force, the disaster response force, with a clear mandate so that we stop this improvising and you know, doing a little bit of uh, relief through the army, a little bit through the uh, armed police. These are not equipped to handle a large disaster. We need to recognize the power of the digital A's and use of new tools, media, and partnerships. The war room mentality, the, 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 uh, the, the new political skills, I think, uh, needs to be learned from Western countries. And these opportunities to try out new tools for monitoring and accountability, including crowdsourced maps, data collection in tablets, GPS coordinates, real-time tracking of projects, establishing full accountability and transparency. It's very easy to do if you have people with the right intentions running the show. And this, is, this was very much what we intended uh, in the old team. And, uh, and a lot of the inspiring lessons are you don't need to go far. You know, the project Aadhaar uh, that is being uh, piloted in India, uh, getting the, giving unique ID to a billion people and through that sort of channeling and targeting um, assistance. I think the third lesson is we really need to ensure that uh, the buck stops in Balwatar, which is the prime minister's office and the residence. And this larger political lack of responsiveness, you know, uh, is tied to a larger dysfunction. And uh, there's some discussion now on, you know, we fought in Nepal for a, for a democratic system for 70 years. But the kind of democracy that we have now is what Farid Zakaria calls and other scholars, political scientists have called illiberal democracy. We have periodic elections, but there's insufficient attention to the fundamental tenets of liberalism, you know, the rule of law, accountability, separation of powers, uh, assurance of sort of basic rights, uh, liberties of speech, assembly, uh, right to owning property. I think those aspects have really been um, un underestimated and even undermined. If you have ritualistic elections every three, four, five years, that's democracy. So I think that needs to be turned around. And there the role for the civil society and the media to demand that leadership is seen and heard, it's held to account. And uh, what I found, you know, no matter how much hard work we put in at the National Planning Commission, we are just islands of excellence in a larger sea of malfunction, and it doesn't work. And this ability to multitask, you know, I've heard of no government in the world that says, you know, let's focus on the earthquake. Now let's switch everything to the constitution. Then now it's to something else. What about multitasking? What about delegation? You know, so those competencies, the basic competencies of governance, I think we need to do a much better job. Never permit a void again in local governments. This was, this cost lives. This was deeply damaging. And as the country moves towards a new federated setup, federalism. This will even be more important when the central and the provincial sort of relationship, the strength of the relationship is yet to be formed, tested, uh, tried out, experimented. And the big fear is, you know, this will, uh, Nepal will now move to another phase of prolonged transition. Enforce building codes and revamp the engineering practice. Immediately after the earthquake, I, I requested a very uh, leading Nepali geotechnical engineer based in Vancouver. I, I invited him at my personal initiative to say, can you please review the National Building Code and assess where things, uh, what are the low hanging fruits that we could do immediately? And he came and he spent three months speaking to everyone, um, walking around because there was no fuel uh, at the time uh, in September, October, uh, did a fantastic report, pointed out to deep conflicts of interest, uh, the, uh, the incompetence uh, in the existing authorities, uh, you know, Department of Urban Development and Building Construction, DUDBC, which is the main regulator of Nepal Building Courts, is, you know, its whole mandate is compromised because it itself designs and manages construction of public buildings. The review of drawings for uh, compliance of the building codes uh, during municipal permitting process is limited. Structural engineers design everything, including foundations. Geotechnical input in the design process is non-existent. The concept of quality control and quality assurance is virtually non-existent. So this needs to be overhauled. Yet the political interests and the bureaucratic interests will resist it, but this has to be done with a strong lens. Sixth lesson is really, I think in the PDNA, we did a very good job in looking at issues through a, through a gendered approach. 
if you look at the data, women and girls died more than men. 55% uh, of the casualties were women and girls. Um, partly because of the gendered roles, they were inside, indoors, doing things at home, and partly because of the out-migration of young males. Needs of women in housing, sanitation, security has not been reflected adequately. In the PDNA, we did the gender audit. There was a colleague of mine, Dr. Bimala Rai, who did a thorough job, line by line, looking at everything from a gender perspective. But when it came to operations, and when it was the job of the ministries, uh, this aspect was not given adequate attention. And, uh, and there are issues of uh, deeper issues. You know, If you're distributing two lakh rupees as cash grant, if you're giving uh, assistance of different forms through the state, and the basis for receiving those assistance is a citizenship document, mm -hmm. birth registration, or land ownership, women are automatically penalized. So this gendered lens will have to be brought in in a much more systematic way. And I have some complaint on the international humanitarian scene as well, and I have some, um, I don't have time to go into the details, but the current development architecture is not conducive to swift assistance. So Nepal's experience, you know, there's a long gestation period for large project design and approval. Um, the challenge of syncing immediate needs with rigid budget cycles of the countries, home countries, is, um, I was told the, the US government wants to help uh, quite generously, and I think only recently, after months and months of preparation, the bill prepared by Senators Cardin and Kirk uh, passed, and I think uh, there's some uh, dedicated act of uh, Congress uh, bill in the Congress uh, dedicated to Nepal's reconstruction, but it took months and months to get this through. Similarly with the EU and the, Jap and the Japanese. There's fungibility in the use of funds. You know, it's difficult to muster additional resources. The temptation for the pile to the other. It's not there. And, uh, and I've been, uh, um, Second Committee in New York, the need for a LDC Catastrophe Preparation and Mitigation Fund. This has been tried in the Caribbean, and I think this is something we need to uh, work on for all the least developed countries. A healthier balance between protection and uh, prevention and coping. The ex ante risk management and the ex post uh, risk management, and, and, and the way we design these, these systems to help with a swift. Uh, recovery efforts um, uh, in, in, in the case of humanitarian disasters, especially in, in low-income countries. So let me conclude. Um, overall, I think the early phase of Nepali response to the earthquake stood out for the grit, the sacrifice, and the irrepressible spirit against material and geographic hardship by the people affected, by the people affected, the youth volunteers, parts of the state, especially the security forces and the civil service, many NGOs, private sector, diaspora, and our neighbors. But this could not be sustained for long because good people need to get back to their day jobs. <coughs> Ultimately, it is the political process and the system it upholds that has to perform and be held to account. But if the incentive structure is perverted to such an extent that it is not penalized for being unresponsive and callous, the problems magnify and cost precious lives. It is a stretch to expect pockets of excellence to endure or thrive in a sea of malfunction. Like the slow pace of development, the post-disaster response ultimately succumbed to the failures of governance in a regime that calls itself democratic because it goes through the ritualistic motions of periodic elections, but has still not imbibed the fundamental tenets of a liberal system, such as the rule of law and accountability. Nepal's tale of post-earthquake recovery so far is therefore one of extraordinary resilience as well as apathy. Not all is lost. If one takes the long view, this process can still be salvaged and set right through informed critique and democratic pressure from within and outside. Even the reconstruction efforts in Indonesia after the Boxing Day tsunami of 2004 and of Northwest Pakistan after the earthquake of 2005, both considered a success, got traction after six to seven months. The post-earthquake response in Nepal demands a renewed political commitment and a rekindled zeal from professionals involved. As I co-wrote in a recent article, the tall tasks ahead include strengthening Nepal's ability to manage complex projects, deepening democratic accountability, and mending the relationship between state and citizen.
Thank you. So I take a few questions. Or take sure. One more, yeah. No, that that issue actually is addressed in great detail in the post-disaster needs assessment in the report. Uh, I skipped the part on principles and objectives of reconstruction policy, and that's where that issue was explicitly mentioned. One of the clear objectives of the reconstruction policy to lift and protect the most vulnerable social and ethnic groups in quake-affected areas, and this is directly speaking to the plight of the Tamangs who were hit in Daswa, in Nuakot, in Sindhu Palchok. And uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the, I mentioned briefly that the MPs wanted a greater say in, uh, in, in how the relief and the reconstruction work proceeded from now on. And uh, there is, there is a, a sizable caucus of Tamang MPs or from the ethnic minorities from uh, Sindhu Palchok and uh, who would increasingly have a say in, in all this. But, um, but the agenda of inclusion, um, equity, you can't escape that in Nepal. It's, uh, uh, I, I may not have brought it out explicitly, but that's all the, the, the undercurrent in everything that we've done in the planning, the reconstruction policy, and the 500 page long PDNA report. You will find uh, that the issue has been done adequate justice. Officially, I don't think any have been built by the government. The, the modality would have been to um, the 15,000 rupees were initially given within the first uh, few weeks. Um, it took time, again, to reach everyone. Um, the 15,000 uh, was aimed at creating a temporary shelter. So the government is not building any house for anyone. That's a matter of principle, right? People would do it themselves, but the government would facilitate with the designs, would send in technical people, and it would eventually issue the two lakh grant, the 200,000 as free money, and it would, be, uh, it would allow the, uh, the people to borrow from commercial banks up to 25 lakhs at 2% interest rate, and that, uh, that would be subsidized by the state. So those were the initial early recovery packages. Uh, now the 15,000, um, to the best of my knowledge, has has reached almost everyone, and people use that for different purposes. Uh, there was at one point um, a discussion to actually give the corrugated sheets by the state, and there was a lot of suspecting foul play on the part of uh, some departments and ministries that that step was scrapped, and it was uh, it was decided that the cash direct cash grant would work better. Um, now. Because of this, up to after the first four months, we've had another four months of this stalemate, as I mentioned earlier, and the authority has not been in existence. 
although the national budget actually uh, assigned almost 91 billion rupees to proceed with the reconstruction through the existing ministries and not wait for the national authority to be to be uh, up and running yet the again this is a deeper issue of why this hasn't been done the ministries have not uh, taken any initiative on their part so to answer your question directly the government will not build any house for the people it is the people who themselves will build it but the government will give this 2 lakh rupees whose modality is now being and a lot of that money will be coming from the world bank again this was my final point uh, in, the, in my lecture the world bank has put on some stringent conditions to ensure that money is uh, used uh, the assessment of damages is now actually been again uh, done again dolakha has been completed now they have moved to dading uh, but this issue of fake Clements has come up, and some, uh, I think, 1,500 engineers are going around and taking data in, you know, uh, uh, tablet uh, computers and feeding that in. So uh, I was, I heard the CEO, the new CEO of the Reconstruction Authority, who said, "We are now ready to proceed with reconstruction work in Dolakha. Now the records have been um, uh, provided. That two lakh grant is coming from the World Bank, and uh, and the World Bank has another con condition that uh, the money should not be given, handed over. It should be, it should be deposited in a bank account." Again, that's going to be add to the complexity. The Tamang villages that we talked about, in the remote parts of Rasua, Dhading, Gorkha, Sindhupalchok, it will be very hard to do. Illiterate people, old people, uh, banks don't want to go there. So how do you make this work? Um, so again, it's a conflict between a swifter delivery and this urge to uh, prevent mismanagement and leakage and wastage. Uh, yet inevitably, a lot of this will happen. But uh, Obviously, uh, there has been a huge setback. That's why I mentioned we started from a high low to disappointment to a distressing neglect that uh, we, we're in right now. So I, I was quite clear on, on the state uh, that we find ourselves in. Um, but uh, the CEO has said from Baisak onwards, which is um, April, uh, I think uh, people would be able to access the two lakh grant, again in tranches, depending on you know, if the foundation get a 50,000, um, one story, maybe another, another trans, another installment, and this is how how it's been planned. But uh, I left the government in November, so I'm not on top of things, uh, the details, the intricacies uh, after that. Had the old team been in uh, thing, um, all this probably the plan was to uh, get this done, uh, you know, September, October, November. Uh, so a lot of th th these things would have started. Uh, one complication uh, with the reconstruction is, I think what was what, what, what the issue that came up in the panel, <coughs> that uh, what if people go ahead and do their own thing? Will they, will they still be eligible for the two lakh grant? And, um, and people who are in a position to, actually who can afford to build their own houses are st also waiting and uh, still living in temporary shelters because they fear, again, this is again the communication part. Um, and the whole, the lack of local government to vet and verify, and uh, that's where we have really lacked. That people uh, are in f are fearful that you know even if they are in a position to build their own houses, they are not doing so. Uh, they think, uh, and of course, the government has already brought out uh, all the earthquake resistant models, like 15, 20, 30 models uh, that can be tailored to different locations uh, and even adapted to different ethnicities. Mm, um, but um, so the fear on the part of the common people is whether, you know, if you didn't follow the designated or the appointed model, whether you would be eligible for the cash grant. So the free money, the concessional money, is actually having a lot of perverse effects as well. People, uh, um, there are, there's a huge group of people who are in genuine need that, d that deserve assistance, uh, but, uh, but a sizable group uh, is actually pretty well off with the remittance money coming in. Um, yet, uh, in the face of free money, it looks like it really distorts incentives for people to proceed. <coughs>